Welcome into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, the Dr. Jimmy Bugelato. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. Uh, we got Ben, our MVP producer behind the glass. And today we're going to um, get into what's going on in the mafia in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, there's actually quite a bit to report. Um, some cases that have already dropped. Some cases that uh, we're hearing are on the verge of dropping. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the OGs in, in Providence LCN like uh, good looking Maddie Guglia Medi and little Eddie, little Eddie Lado, who are the guys that have been around uh, for decades and trace back to the old patriarchal regime. But then kind of maybe the centerpiece of this episode is going to be about a, a, a BG, a baby gangster, <laughs> uh, a new up and coming player in, in the Providence underworld, a guy that's under indictment right now, uh, as well as being investigated for, for other, uh, criminal activities by the state police as well as the federal bureau of investigation his name is dino gomet goes by the nickname the big bully and uh we're gonna break it all down for you so um i want to just tease it out that uh this has been an episode we've been working on for over a month um we we had it set up in a number of different um kind of the way we were going to formulate the episode who we were going to have on it and honestly, we had some interference uh, from the federal government. And I don't want to go any deeper into that other than uh, we had a uh, we had one way that we were going to format this episode and we were going to have a, a, a guest on and the federal government nixed it and, and basically was worried that possibly we would, we would be sharing government secrets or that it would somehow affect uh, either the bringing of this case that's we're being told is going to be coming down the pike here in the next couple of months or the prosecuting of the case once it comes. Yeah. And to be clear, it's not like the feds contacted us. It's the right. guest, the guest, the potential guest <clears throat> was informed that, um, it's someone who's familiar with this investigation and uh, Might have played a role in the investigation yeah, they, at some point. They asked this person not to do any media. So it's red hot there and uh, red hot in Providence right now. Red hot for those three people that I mentioned, especially uh, Gomet and Googly Ametti. Maybe a little less so for Eddie Lato, but um, I guess only time will tell. But uh, a lot to unpack. So let's kind of like start from the, from the beginning. Um, just in terms of how the New England underworld is uh, put together or, you know, what the roadmap of that patriarchal organization is. You've always had two very distinct groups. Um, it's the New England mafia and you have a Boston group and you have a Providence group. And today we're obviously going to be dealing with the Providence group, but um, they work in coordination with each other. And over the years, the boss has shifted um from you know when when old man raymond patriarcho was the boss he was uh, stationed in federal hill you know little italy uh, of the city of providence um for a good 30 years and uh the the seat of power stayed uh in in rhode island for a while then it went to boston when cadillac frank took over then it went back to providence uh under baby shacks minocchio when he took over and then since uh, Baby Shacks stepped down, allegedly, back in the late 2000s, um, the power in the family, the, po the seat of power is in Boston. First, it was with uh, Peter Lamoni, who's, who's passed, um, and now, allegedly, it's with the, um, the Dudunzio brothers, uh, Big Cheese and Little Cheese, who uh, are out of uh, the North End a uh, headquarter out of a, a social club called the Gemini social club. But uh, underneath the big cheese, Carmen Denunzio, you have a former underboss and a current underboss in Providence. Good looking Matty Guglielmetti was the underboss from what I can understand uh, through most of the 2010s uh, came out of a, a, about a nine year prison term. 
I think in 2014, uh, where he got, had to go do uh, a bid for protecting cocaine shipments that were coming through Providence in the early 2000s. Is he a Sicilian guy? Is he from Sicily? Or am I thinking of someone else? You might be thinking of uh, Biagio uh, Di Giacomo. Right, right. Di, okay. Di Giacomo. Uh, uh, Maddie's dad, Maddie Gugliametti Sr., who I think they call Big Maddie, was a very close associate, friend, advisor to Raymond Patriarca. Maddie Jr., good looking Maddie, uh, from a very young age, was around Raymond Sr. Um, there's a famous television clip from Raymond's uh, funeral back in 1984 where uh, a relatively young, good looking Maddie uh, berates the cameramen and the FBI agents there. Goddamn FBI, I don't respect me. <laughs> like Sonny <laughs> in The Godfather. Um, but Maddie is just, uh, doesn't get more respected than, than good looking Maddie. Uh, guys, you know, in his mid 70s now, I believe, or, or pushing up into his mid 70s. I believe he was born in 49. Uh, and he just is one of these guys that has respect in, in every city. Uh, he's a guy whose name rings beyond Providence um, and made a lot of connections. I heard when he was in, when he was locked up uh, with the feds from about 2005 to 2014. And I've heard that he's leveraging those connections allegedly since he's been out. Um, the government believed that he was the underboss, but last year um, in the case that we're going to talk about are the, the one case that's already dropped with another case being investigated, court documents were released that allowed us the knowledge that according to uh, Rhode Island State Police right now, Matty Gugliametti is no longer the underboss. He has voluntarily stepped away. He's now back to a, a capo regime rank. And little Eddie Lado is now, according to the government as of last year, the underboss of the of the patriarchal crime family by the way i just want to acknowledge something that someone contacted us off the record apparently in an in another episode i don't even remember us saying this but we apparently um understated the traditional role that state police play in investigating S italian especially in that part of the country right and a person who was a state police investigator contacted us off the record from the east coast and said that actually that's not true, that, that state police in places like Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Massachusetts are, are very active in investigating traditional OC. O OC. So just want to. Well, I think that, that plays right into the, the story that we're telling right, right. now. So the, the knowledge that little Eddie is now the underboss, uh, another guy that is an OG, goes back to the patriarchal regime. Um, has been in and out of prison really his whole life. Unlike Maddie, who I don't think did a, a bunch of time. Eddie's done a, quite a bit of time uh, and just came out in the last couple years from a, about an eight, nine year sentence on extortion that um, he took with baby shacks and his name as well as good looking Maddie's name have popped up in all these court records related to the young up and comer, Dino Gomet. Um, so let's just give a little background. Right now, as we speak here in the summer of 2023, uh, Gomet, who is about 45, uh, is under indictment for distributing illegal uh, prescription anxiety pills um, like um, uh, Xanax and. Uh, um, there's another pharmaceutical name I'm blanking on. By the way, like I would say he's doing a public service if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I would <laughs> just drop the charges. Any anyway, that, to make that's just an editorial. <laughs> we all, we need as much anxiety medicine as we can get. I take anxiety medicine, but it's prescribed. It's prescribed. Uh, so what, what's the big? Deal? Uh, so so Dino um, does not have a major criminal record. He only really came on, came into the spotlight because of this case. And then once this case hit, 
a local Providence media outlet, and let's give a, a, a tip of the hat to Go Local Prov, which has done the, you know, the most comprehensive reporting on this particular case, that, and, and there's still a lot more to be written. But in terms of the investigation, I don't think we would have known you know, 80% of what we know now if it wasn't for the reporting that the people at Go Local Prov have been doing but uh, Dino, they have sorry to interrupt, but I, I have them up now and they have really cool links to documents and images. And so I, I encourage our audience. To check oh, it's, it a, out. it's a it's a great resource. And um, so they've been reporting for the last year that in addition to the pill case, Dino Gomet is the focus of a wholesale cocaine distribution case that is being worked uh in tandem between Rhode Island State Police and the FBI. And a lot of the documentation from the pill case is referencing this other investigation that has yet to come to fruition. But um, everything that we're hearing is that there, there will most likely be a case that is brought uh, at some point before the end of the year. and. Within those documents that have been put forth uh, by the government and then exposed by go, go, by Go Local Prov in their, uh, you know, uh, on their site and, and in their social media, there are direct links in this investigation to Good Looking Maddie Guglielmetti, um, uh, controlled purchases of cocaine that have been made according to these files by. Uh, members of law enforcement from Dino Gomet and that they have on uh, from confidential inf informants on firsthand uh, relays that percentages of this cocaine distribution network are being passed to good looking Maddie. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll throw it over to Jimmy for his thoughts, Dino Gomet from everything I've heard from everyone I've spoken to is mentored by good looking Maddie. Good looking Maddie looks at him uh almost like he's a, a blood relative, even though I don't believe he is. And that from a pretty young age, Dino was driving around good looking Maddie and being his bodyguard and uh has kind of now graduated, if you believe the scuttlebutt, uh to made man status in, in the last year. Yeah, from the the people I've talked to, apparently he's well liked in those circles. But I um this is this is from the actual public documentation that Gulmet this is word for word, I'm reading from the affidavit that he's involved in this practice in furtherance of his allegiance to the N E L C N, which is New England La Cosa Nostra. So right there in the language they're trying to link what he's doing to a larger right. conspiracy, which is um, traditionally how this works. If someone's a, a member, they, they have to kick up a percentage of their, their, um, you know, whatever they're earning. But I, I you know, I, I can be somewhat skeptical in the sense of, of course that they want to believe that because they want to get, they always want to get the small fish and move up and and get the bigger fish. I, I, I mean, we don't know yet. We have to let let the the case play out. But um, it, it it very well could be that that this is traditionally in a traditional arrangement where this is in furtherance of the overall organization. But um, it doesn't. Let's just say I, it doesn't surprise me that that the That's government saying. is saying that the government is saying that. Um, they, I mean, they they seem to be showing. Proof. I mean, at least in terms of if you're going to believe the confidential informants, and that's a whole other you know rabbit hole that we could jump down. Well, of course, but they yeah. have confidential informants that are, uh, I guess, very close to these uh, money um, exchanges that are telling them that uh, Guglielmetti is seeing a piece of Dino's business. Dino, I guess, isn't shy in being seen around town with good-looking Maddie. Uh, I, I'm being told that they're. They're kind of a, uh, when you see one, you, you're, you're quite likely to see the other. Uh, Dino is a younger guy. He seems to be uh, another 
commonality between him and Guglielmetti, from what I've been told, is they're both notorious ladies' men. Uh, good looking Maddie, just by the nickname, you could, he was a good looking guy or is a good looking guy. Now he's, you know, he's a little older, but back in the day he was known as a, um, as a playboy. And I guess Dino has, uh, a similar reputation right now. He's in a relationship with Shiana Jenkins, who her ex-husband, you might've heard of his name was Aaron Hernandez. He was an NFL tight end for the new England Patriots who was sent away to, uh, sent away to prison for murder and then committed suicide in prison. It, was, it got quite a bit of headlines. Was she interviewed in that documentary? Yeah. She's, so she's been like accessible to the public. Yeah. About, wow. So she, she obviously has, uh, seems to have a thing for a certain type of individuals. <laughs> um, and, and it's not, they're just, they don't just, um, they're not just a couple. They, they share a, a child. Um, so uh, Shina Jenkins is Dino's baby mama as well as uh, girlfriend or possible fiance. Um, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to have, um, if you were in that world, wouldn't you rather have a nickname like good looking, good looking Maddie than big bully? Like, uh, Johnny roast beef. Or something. Good looking <laughs> something Maddie's like a great that. nickname. The bit. So the, uh, that's quack, quack. I'd rather have be called good looking Sal or some good looking, uh, you know, Maddie than uh, or handsome Stevie in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then quack, but, quack, but let's or, go to how Dino got the nickname. So Dino made his name in his 20s uh, as a participant in tough man competitions. Mm. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie yeah. um, War, uh, Warrior with uh, Nick Nolte and uh, Tom Hardy, and, and, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, oh, and, and it's, it's a great movie. It's like the modern day Rocky. Uh, it's about the M- world of that. MMA. Oh, Anyway, they, they sh- the only reason I'm bringing it up is that they show that before these characters actually make it to MMA, they're making like extra money. Like one guy is a, is a school teacher and he makes like extra money going into like the backwoods of Pennsylvania where like uh, a bar and a radio station will like covertly put on a, a, a legal boxing match. Oh, fight club kind of thing. Well, it's not Fight Club. Like, it's not like held like in a basement. Like, I it's see. actually like staged. And there, people are betting on. Yeah, it, probably. people are yeah, betting yeah. on it, and they have ring girls and yeah, a yeah. announcer. And yeah, that's how Mr. T actually. Yeah, that's how he got. That's how won a tough man competition in in uh, Chicago and got recognized by uh, Stallone. But uh, so that's how he got the nickname, the Big Bully. Um, just he was a I guess a staple in these tough man competitions. And I think he he boxed. Uh, I don't I don't believe he ever turned pro, but was an amateur boxer um, in the area, Golden Gloves, um, and so forth. So he's a guy that, even though he hasn't been on on our radar or maybe even on the government's radar until recently, you know, within Providence, in in the kind of like the the circles of of guys that are brawlers and. And guys that are, you know, kind of, I don't want to say cowboys because we don't know that he's a cowboy. In fact, we actually hear he's kind of the opposite, um, but uh, kind of. Uh, it sounds like a, just a bruiser. Desperados, you know, guys that are, that are kind of, uh, uh, you know, ragtag fighters that, are, that can also make, you know, great um, recruits for, for, for the mob. Yeah. So. According to these um, court filings, Dino is being financed in his drug affairs by the wife of a very prominent Rhode Island legitimate uh, businessman. And so I want to be very clear when we say this, uh, the, the, the businessman, his name is Jerry McGraw. He is the, uh, owns the, um, one of the few cannabis license, legal cannabis license in Rhode Island. He has the uh, lion's share of the legal marijuana market in Rhode Island, Jerry McGraw. I want to be very clear. Jerry McGraw has not been implicated in anything. So I just want to state that from the get-go. Jerry McGraw's wife has been. Um, And what I'm told is that 
I believe her name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth McGraw and Dino Gomet used to be a couple, uh, used to date. And according to the government now, and these are, this is in you know, the record, uh, confidential informants have told the FBI that Elizabeth McGraw helps finance Dino Gomet's cocaine operation. Well, and this is from Go Local Prov too, just so okay. people know that you know this isn't just conjecture, right? Conjecture, underworld sources, whatever. But that um, this is uh, that this, the wife had more than one thousand phone calls and texts with accused drug dealer, which uh, in and of itself doesn't prove anything. But with depending on the content of those texts and some of the other circumstantial evidence, could prove problematic for this person. And, and then there's, there's, there's one thing I noticed and, you know, I, I guess if you're not paying attention, it would easily go past your radar. But I guess if you are paying attention, like a reporter, you know, it raises some red flags. Um, <laughs> the, uh, according to these documents, Gomet is getting his product from the Caribbean. And if you go to Gomet's social media, there's quite a few uh, uh, photos and albums of him in the Cayman Islands uh, partying with, with uh, friends and associates. So again, I mean, we, we don't, nothing has been charged. All, all uh, Dino is dealing with right now as we speak is the pill case. Um, but it seems like he'll have, uh, more legal problems on the horizon. If, if you're reading the tea leaves here. Yeah. And this, uh, obviously he denies this all. And, and even with the earlier charges, yeah, he pled, Benzos, he's pled not guilty, pled not guilty. He asked for it to be dismissed, which the court wouldn't do. I'm just looking at the, the go local. And, and another uh, thing reporting. that, you know, I don't want to say raises red flags because you know i I don't want to say that just because you're you're hanging out in federal hill means that you're a gangster because federal hills you know a a tourist destination for people in providence plenty of legitimate people spend a lot of time in federal hill but it's also been known for a half century plus as ground zero for uh the mob in providence and uh dino's up on the hill quite a bit he uh spends a lot of time at a a social club called the toscan social club and uh according to these filings has been an, an invitee to the annual providence patriarch a crime family holiday party which takes place uh, in de- December of every year, uh, just like most crime families, <laughs> just like most businesses and corporations have a Christmas party. So does the mob. And uh, the last couple, I guess, Dino has been at these events and has sat at the same table as good looking Maddie Guglielmetti and little Eddie Lato. So it's interesting because for I mean, it sounds like in some ways that this isn't um, super low key, but on the other hand, to have this much intel, somebody's telling yeah. on it. Somebody, right. somebody who's at this party and, is and, telling and on they it. obviously have court ordered taps and whatnot. Right. To we're we're seeing in these filings about texts and messages and phone calls. Yeah, there's They're some like, candid like personal yeah. photos that were released yeah. in the. The court documents. Um, I'm assuming they got from their phone and social media. There was just a uh, an incident in the last year where a, a, a pretty high ranking member of the uh, assemb- the House Assembly in Providence, I believe, it was the chief of staff for the the essentially the Rhode Island legislature. The yeah, I think of, it was the speaker. It was someone affiliated the with the speaker chief, of the house. The speaker of chief, the chief of staff for the speaker. I think so. Was forced to resign. And this has only been in the last year because of 
business investments that this guy had made with members of organized crime related to legal marijuana distribution. Um, which again, it's, it's legal as long as you don't have a criminal record. Because if you have a criminal record, you can't have a license to move mm. legal cannabis. So when they find a guy like Raymond Jenkins, who goes by the nickname Scarface, uh, Scarface Jenkins is a guy that's been around forever. He's been an enforcer, collector for guys like it, uh, in Providence, for guys like Leto and, and Guglielmetti. And uh, he, I guess, was a childhood friend of this uh, chief of staff of a politician. And they were invested in a, uh, a, a marijuana grow as well as a, a marijuana um, retail. Well, when we had, um, uh, we did that episode with um, O'Donnell, who was went undercover. I think in that episode, didn't he say like the, the in his his feeling was that the Italians were really trying to make a push into like the legal marijuana? I everywhere. I mean, yeah. I don't think it's just out east. I mean, yeah. I see it here in Detroit. Um, I think one of the biggest misnomers that I've ever heard spoken by a, 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 a a member of the government, and I'm sure there are there are echoes of what was being uh, told to the public a hundred years ago during Prohibition. But this notion that legalizing marijuana was going to eliminate the black market, when in reality it it supercharges the black market. Well, yeah, I mean the government doesn't say the government wants the war on drugs to continue, yeah. but but people like me say it will it will reduce the black market. But I, I, which I still stand by. But I think your point is well taken. Those of us that advocate drug legalization or at least decriminalization um, who are being honest about it do acknowledge that you will it's impossible to completely el- eliminate a black market from any of these things. So even like for gambling, right? You, you will cut down on the black market significantly, but it's it's not like there I mean there are still bookmakers back alley bookmakers uh casino nights underground casino well, nights. now i mean every- so it's the same thing with drugs you're always going to have people that want to score their dope um either either through like a street dealer or what you're talking about which is it's nominally legal but, but no, through it, the back end you still get you're your hands anybody can get a license as long as you don't have a criminal record but raymond jenkins who was involved in this business yeah is a a, a you know someone who has a rap sheet that is as long as his arm. I mean, you look at legalized, I know it's not that way now, but you look at legalized gambling in Vegas. I mean, you don't think the mob was involved in that. I mean, that, we all know that's a well-told history. Yeah. Um, so just because you legalize something doesn't mean you're going to keep the black market. You're going to suppress the black market, nor does it guarantee organized crime Figures won't get involved in the legalized aspect of these industries. But again, we don't usually get into partisan politics, but this is criminal justice, public policy. Well, so and they were very, I don't, very I don't bra- mind editorializing. I, I still think it's the right direction. And I think that I suspect that there, there might have been some dovetailing in the Gomet or uh, investigation and what was found last, I believe it was last fall. Uh, with Jenkins and, and, and the, uh, the guy in the legislature. Um, but Jenkins and that guy were being very brazen. Like Jenkins was being allowed like into the private parking lot of the assembly where he would meet with the right. guy. Yeah. It was and, pretty conspicuous. Yeah. Like, they weren't really going out of their way to hide their interactions. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I, I don't have any proof, but I sense that, um, we could hear some of those names again uh, as this other case starts to pick up steam. I have no, I have, again, I have no proof of that, but um, I, I, I seem to think it would be difficult if, if these two investigations hadn't somehow um, bumped into each other. Can you speak to the, uh, maybe just, we just got to look into the documents, but if off the top of your head, speak to the weight that they're alleging in terms of cocaine, because in, in, the, in these documents that I was looking at, it says multi Kilograms, Kilo, yeah. which, what does that mean? Four, three? <laughs> what does that mean? Are we talking about yeah. hundreds? Like what? What kind of? Yeah, I didn't get. I didn't get. I, I it know. Seems pretty vague to be. You're, you're talking about, but anytime you're talking about kilo weight, I mean, you're talking about wholesale. Yeah, I would think. Yeah, but and I if you're getting, if you're plug info. again based on 
what we've heard, nothing has um, been proven yet. But if if your plug is in uh, the Caribbean and you're making trips down there, my guess is he ain't going down there for a couple kilos. Right. You're not going down there to negotiate a two kilo deal or a four kilo deal. Which, by the way, this is just something, you know, global organized crime, um, which is something that I'm really interested in. And I know you are, but it seems like when we do episodes on it, no one else seems to be. <laughs> but we work to it. Cartel thing. I just think it's 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 just globally very significant and important. But um, it shows you that there are still some of those old school drug routes and and whatever, regardless of this case or not, whether this turns out to be true, but um, most of the Coke is coming through the Southwest border, but not all of it. Some of it is still coming through the old school Caribbean, Florida, especially some of the stuff that gets to the East coast. Yeah. We know comes up from those old traditional smuggling distribution routes, routes yeah. distribution routes, which is kind of interesting because I think there's this sense now that, Oh, it's, it all comes through California and Arizona, Texas. A lot of it does, yeah. maybe most of it, but not not all of it. Yeah, and again, especially when we're talking about proximity and on the East Coast or right. down South where you're actually probably closer to those areas than you would be to yeah. the, the points of entry that are coming into California, Arizona, and Texas. Yeah. Um, I think there are, you know, two, two big takeaways for me here. One, at least in New England, and at least when it comes to Providence, these LCN figures appear to still remain a top priority for law enforcement out there, which I think is a bit of an outlier when it comes to other areas. And I think it's like right now, New York, Philadelphia, and Providence seem to be the areas where most of the law enforcement activity is going on. I would on. put Buffalo in there now. Oh, you're right, Buffalo. I'm sorry. Buffalo, yes, right now. Um, when areas like Detroit and Chicago um, don't seem to get that as much attention. Right. Well, uh, that's because there is no money. Right. <laughs> um, but when it comes to specifically these two patriarchs, if you will, um, of the patriarchal crime family in Providence, these two um, real old timers, Eddie Lado and, and Maddie Guglielmetti, it seems like, the ultimate goal for the government is to make it so that both Eddie and Maddie uh, live the final years of their lives behind bars and die in prison. They don't seem to be letting up on them just because they're retirement age. And, you know, the, the counter to that would be, well, they haven't retired. So why would we stop, uh, um, you know, pursuing them? Uh, both of these guys are convicted felons. Eddie is really right now at, at the apex of his career. You know, he was a guy that was a soldier, then became a capo, had never really been an administrator. I don't know if anyone really thought of him as an administrator. I think a lot of people thought of, of who, who Maddie. Was, who did he come up under? Who was like his? his uh... Eddie, um, I believe Eddie came up under um, the guy they called Mulligan, Eddie Romano. I could be mistaken. But those were always patriarchal guys. Patriarchal guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but Eddie's been around forever. Were these guys involved in the Civil War back in the, with Cadillac? Well, they were. Junior? Guglielmetti was one of the people that was trying to make peace. He was one uh, of the okay. guys that was like holding or participating in peace conferences. I see. And then when, uh, when. One of the, uh, after one of the machinations in that war, I know that there was a meeting where Maddie was telling everybody in Connecticut that had been kicking up to Boston was now kicking to him. Mm. Um, he had a meeting with like the whole Connecticut patriarchal crew uh, at some point in the 90s. Um, Eddie Lado is in a more precarious position right now. It, you know, you kind of, you have the situation where, you know, he's reached the highest levels of his career. And I know that this is a guy that's a true blue gangster who, uh, 
believes in the rules, believes in the life. Um, but it, according to what's it about? What's it all about? <laughs> about parameters. It's about parameters. <laughs> <laughs> you take a beating for a friend. Uh, it's about the rules. <laughs> Eddie still has a murder hanging over his head right now. And I don't think that that murder will come up if he's included in this case. I, I don't, my gut tells me that there's a chance that just Dino might go down in this case and then they might be using the case to leverage Dino into cooperating against Maddie and Eddie. Uh, I don't know. But Eddie, when he came out of prison and I believe he came out in 2019, there had been grand jury testimony around that time that Eddie was a shooter in the unsolved September 1992 gangland slain of Kevin Hanrahan, mm. which is one of the more infamous mm -hmm. unsolved murders in, in uh, New England mafia history. Kevin Hanrahan was a Irish strong arm that worked for the Italians, very feared, a guy that had allegedly done hits for the Patriarchas. Um, and it came out recently, I mean, relatively recently, that we never knew for sure why uh, Kevin Hanran was killed. He was killed, I believe it was September 18th, 1992, in Federal Hill or on Federal Hill, uh, leaving a, um, a steakhouse where he was meeting with members of organized crime and told them he had to go uh, hook up with someone to, to grab his piece of a score. Uh, he he said, I'll, you know, I'll meet you guys at this bar down the street and left the steakhouse and I think, you know, went less than 100 yards and uh, was killed I, by two I, masked I, I can't remember. Was that related to the politics or was that a personal beat? Okay, that, so. What's the main theory? Right, so we didn't know until recently, and it comes out that it was related to the politics. Okay. I think for a long time, the belief was that he was just muscling in on stuff that wasn't his, so they killed him. But that's not what came out. Um, and I apologize for, for jumping around and throwing out all these names at you again, but a lot of this information came out when Cadillac Frank was finally brought to justice for the Stevie DeSaro murder. Mm -hmm. I want to tease something out with that. I think at some point in the next month, we're going to do a deep dive into, into the Stevie DeSaro murder because it's the 30 year anniversary right now. Um, Stevie DeSaro was a nightclub owner that was in business with Cadillac Frank and his son, they believed that he was going to flip. So they killed him. They buried him uh, underneath a piece of property in Providence back in 1993. Um, the guy that owned that property gets busted in 2016, which is 20, almost 25 years later for, for, for uh, growing marijuana. At that point, marijuana had not been legalized. Uh, growing marijuana uh, at that piece of property. He's looking at jail time and he goes for his get out of jail free card. Basically like you want to know what's underneath this uh, converted textile mill that I'm uh, growing my marijuana in. There's a dead body in there from 25 years ago. Uh, so they dug the body up. Cadillac Frank gets arrested, eventually convicted, but Cadillac Frank's kind of right hand man, Bobby DeLuca, AKA Bobby, the cigar, He's involved in it as well. He becomes the star witness against Salemi. But within his debriefing, he has to cop to other cases. And he cops to his role in the Kevin Hanrahan murder and fills in the details about what was going on. So what was going on was Raymond Patriarca Sr. dies in 84, hands over the organization to Raymond Patriarca Jr., who is just a complete and utter disaster as a mob boss. Um, had no respect, uh, was someone that uh, couldn't get along with people, couldn't, the, the guys in Boston hated him. The guys in Providence didn't love him. Uh, he eventually goes down uh, in a federal racketeering case. And I guess, according to Bobby DeLuca in his grand jury testimony, while Patriarcha Jr. is in prison in 1993, he's trying to organize some type of palace coup 
And he reaches out to Hanrahan, who was one of his dad's main muscle, and gives Hanrahan, and it, it sounds crazy coming from Raymond Patriarcha Jr. because he, this was not a violent mob boss. He was, he was meek. But according to DeLuca, Raymond Patriarcha Jr. puts out hit contracts on Cadillac Frank and Baby Shack's Minocchio, who was Cadillac Frank's underboss at that time, and gives the contracts to Hanrahan. Which is also interesting because initially Cadillac Frank was Patriarcha Jr.'s guy. Right. So there's all sorts of duplicity right. and double crossing. And the only reason Cadillac Frank got made. Right. Because he couldn't get made before, because Cadillac Frank had to go away to prison for 15 years for blowing up a, 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 a lawyer that they thought was about to cooperate against Patriarcha Sr. Patriarcha Sr. used Cadillac Frank on numerous hits, mm -hmm. but would never make him because Cadillac Frank was half Irish. Right. Old man Patriarcha dies. Young Patriarcha comes in, and the, sh the sharks are circling. He needs muscle. He needs a politician. He needs someone to basically be his, be his, uh, his, his junkyard dog. Yeah. And he taps Salemi, makes Salemi, sends him to Boston, says, you're in charge of Boston right now. The guys in Boston don't like it, and it, a war erupts. Which was another interesting layer. I know where it, but it, yeah. it is all New England, but because Cadillac Frank was a Boston guy, not liked in Boston, right, but aligned with Providence, Providence right. <laughs> even though he was a and Boston then, guy. And then when Cadillac Frank becomes boss and he's living in Boston, who does he surround himself with? Not Italians, yeah, Irish around, all the Irish guys, and he aligns with the Whitey Bulger yeah. um, Winter Hill group, and his group of, uh, at least his first layer of protection, the guys that were his bodyguards and drivers were all young Irish guys. Yeah, I, I love that, that era. It's... Um, it's so fascinating that whole that whole once old man patriarcha dies through yeah. the nineties. Oh. It's really fascinating yeah. the politics of that. It didn't. Situation. I mean, it, it was a it was probably fifteen years of destabilization. Yeah, and before. then it ties into the whole Bulger FBI right. stuff. And it's, it's really interesting. Baby Shacks um, was able to calm everything down, and he was a great boss. Um, but Bobby DeLuca did not like Baby Shacks. Bobby DeLuca had a real issue with Baby Shacks and began cooperating because he didn't like Baby Shacks. Um, but just like Salemi, they cut their first cooperation deal without giving all of the information they had. <laughs> they didn't fully disclose. They, they both get pulled out of witness protection and have to do the whole thing again. Bobby DeLuca now is back in witness protection. But getting back to why we started talking about this in the first place, Bobby DeLuca goes on the stand in a grand in multiple grand juries between 2017 and 2020 and points the finger at Eddie Lado for being one of the trigger men in that Kevin Hanrahan hit. He names the other trigger man as Rocco Argenti, who went by the nickname Shaky, who was Baby Shack's conciliary before he died of cancer. Yeah. And Hanrahan was was murdered on the street in September 92. Uh, FBI surveillance caught Eddie Lado, Bobby DeLuca, Rocco Argenti, and some other leaders within minutes of the murder, or let's say within a half hour of the murder, they were seen at a uh, Providence bar kind of huddled in a booth, um, presumably talking about what had just happened. There was a lot of belief three or four years ago that Eddie Leto wasn't going to walk out of prison, that he was going to be released from his extortion sentence and immediately uh, indicted on the Hanran hit, but that never happened. So who tipped off Cadillac Frank and those guys that Hanran got yeah, we the don't, contract We from? don't know. Somehow, it, somehow someone tipped them off. Somehow Baby Shacks and Cadillac Frank got tipped off that Hanrahan had contract or yeah. that Patriarch Jr. had contracts on their heads and that Kevin Hanrahan was the one that was trying to yeah. carry him out. So it was a preemptive. Yeah. Uh, and I guess one of the uh, one of the things that Bobby Luca told them or that they had heard was that Hanrahan was going to find where Cadillac Frank and uh, Baby Shacks were meeting one day and put a bomb in a suitcase <laughs> and like drop the suitcase wherever they were and then leave and then detonate the bomb. Um, and then I think there was another story about trying to use like a, 
I don't even know if they used the term drone back then, but like a remote control radio remote controlled uh, uh, airplane that had uh, munitions in it and fly it into um, <laughs> That's pretty creative baby shacks uh, headquarters or whatnot. So uh, <laughs> I, I know that Leto has been on the fringes of this current investigation. He's been outed by the government as the new underboss. So that shows that he has some real standing right now. Um, he's been named as being a, uh, at these Christmas parties that I presumably he's hosting him and Maddie are hosting that, that Dino um, has been at, but unlike Maddie Google and Medi, where you have a lot of connections between Dino and Maddie, I haven't seen the connections between Dino and Eddie. So I don't know, you know, where Eddie stands with all this. Like I, I, I would bet good money that Dino will be indicted for this um, in this cocaine distribution case. It will be really interesting to see where this puts Maddie and Eddie, um, whether they're in the indictment, whether, like, like I said before, they're trying to try to use it to leverage Dino against them. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to point out as, as a takeaway here was that the word on the street is that Dino was a part of a new induction class for the New England La Cosa Nostra at some point in the last four or five years, probably sometime in the last two or three years, uh, that there was about a half a dozen Providence guys. And I've got this from both sides of the law. I've heard this from a dozen people. The names of who's, who, who were actually inducted very, but um, that this was a, a group that came in under Eddie and Maddie in Providence. I heard from people that I trust that Boston had nothing to do with this, that Maddie and Eddie brought these guys in, had whatever permission from Boston to bring them in and made them in Providence. But then I heard from another source, a really, really good source, um, who pushes back on that and says, if that's true, if this handful of guys from Providence have been made in the last couple of years, there's no way Maddie and Eddie would have just done it themselves, that they would have had to bring them to Boston, which has kind of been SOP uh, dating back to Patriarcha, um, where I believe Jerry Angelo, who was the underboss to Patriarcha in Boston, he was doing the make. I don't think Raymond was even doing the makings. They would send people like Matt, for instance, good looking Maddie. It's in a court filing that good looking Maddie was part of an induction class in 1978 where there was like eight of them. And these were guys that were very close to Patriarcha and they took a trip into the North end uh, from Providence and were made by Jerry. Raymond was not present. What was the one, the infamous case that they caught on wiretap? Right, the, 80, uh, the 89 yeah. um, induction ceremony in Boston that they caught, yeah. uh, which was, was a up. way to end the war, which was Salemi was on one end of the war, and uh, the Boston guys were on the other end with uh, J.R. Russo as kind of the Boston elder statesman who was representing the disenfranchised Boston group. And... Raymond Jr. was basically told by J.R. Russo, you're going to step down. And before you step down, you're going to make five of my guys. You're going to appoint me to be the conciliary. And if you don't do these three things, I'm going to kill you. And this was, there was a meeting, I guess, it took place at a jewelry store in Providence, the back room of a jewelry store. And according to people that were at the meeting, Raymond Jr. started crying, like broke down in tears. Um, so that was the result of that was this making ceremony in October of 1989 where they bugged a house where they knew the making ceremony was going to go on and they got the whole thing on tape. And within a couple weeks, everybody was, where was the house though? What was Medford, it? which is like a suburb in, Ma of, in Massachusetts, in Boston, Medford is in yeah, right yeah. outside of Boston. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. What's your, what's your take on, uh, if, if Dino is made, uh, do you think this is something that, does it make sense that it would just be a Providence thing or? 
Um, we, we've been hearing rumblings about that in, in Philadelphia and Detroit, the, these idea of these kind of um, making ceremonies that um, you no longer have the joint family, that it's sort of more regional or by crew. Truly. And, and there's, there seems to be consensus that the boss still has to sign off on it. So it's not like it's a totally it's rogue, rogue yeah. thing, but that um, it's not the kind of traditional um, everyone's there, at least in the hierarchy, or at least because like you point out, it wasn't uncommon even back in the day for the boss to not be there, right? But at least conciliary, underboss, some of the captains from from the different factions would be there. Um, that's definitely the protocol as you, as you point out. So the trend seems to be, and we've talked about it on here before, the trend seems to be allegiance to your crew or your crew boss, as opposed to allegiance to the whole family. Well, and I think part of that is by design because the, 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 whoever the boss is wants insulation. And yeah. so the, the, the least kind of direct contact they have with these different crews, the better. So some of it is, is by, is by design and, um, you know, when you talk to some people on the street, um, at least within some organizations, um, it's by design in the case that in some type cases, crews don't even know guys in, in other crews. Mm -hmm. um, and the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is. Right, and that's on, again, that's on purpose. So that if someone, there's a chink in the armor and somebody flips, they can't bring the whole, the whole thing down because they don't, they're not privy to the whole, you know, everything that's going on everywhere. I want to bring something else out and throw it at you. Because uh, I think this is kind of a maybe a microcosm, or maybe it's a, a a unicorn, or you know, represents something that doesn't normally happen, but just is happening in in this city or this scenario. But it seems like someone like Dino Gomet doesn't need a button, doesn't need to be affiliated with organized crime, that he can make a, a good deal of money. In his, you know, if, if he wants to do illegal activity, he can carve out a nice living without any of the fanfare or heat or scrutiny that it comes from hanging out with guys like good looking Matty Gugliametti and little Eddie Leto. As, as I mentioned, he, you know, he's relatively young. He's 40, I think he's 44 or 45 years old. I guess the point I'm making is, that it, at least in Providence, there appears to still be some cachet or glitzy sex appeal to having or, or getting made or getting a button, even if it doesn't really improve your bottom line. Like your bottom line is going to be the same. You're still going to be making a lot of money. You just be able to have a status symbol. Well, in, in criminology, we talk about these like concentric circles, like predisposition and, and opportunity. And some guys have, uh, you know, the predisposition and the opportunity, but we know there are cases where they still turn it down. Right. So where they say uh, it's, it brings too much heat, I'm not going to do it. But for some other guys, again, with the predisposition, like um, if they're predisposed, they grow up in that environment and that there, there's meaning to them. Like, like one thing that we talk about a lot in criminology, we don't really get into it too much with Cosa Nostra, but we talk about, uh, bikers or, or street gangs, it's identity formation. Like it's really important in terms of the psychology of why would you be part of this kind of organization? It's not always purely entrepreneurial. Yeah. Like there, there's a social psychological component to it that it, it, it it's part of your identity. It means something to you. If you grew up in this environment, uh, to your point, um, obviously there is the entrepreneurial component, but it's not only that. Like but other, so, I mean, the other guys in the past would get their button because it gave them a license to steal. Yeah. It gave them a yeah. license to go and use the button to get rich. And you're untouchable. And now a little, it, it, it reminds me a little bit of Benji Arrelata in Springfield. And this was 20 years ago. But it's another example of Benji was rolling in money before he ever took an oath. I mean, Benji was, was probably wealthier or as wealthy as any button in Springfield when he was in his 20s, but he still felt compelled when he had an opportunity, when the New York guy said, we want to make you, yeah. even though that's going to put a bigger target on your back. Right. But it's, it, symbolically, yeah. it, it, it meant something to him. There's something symbolic about it, which is a, is a sociological uh, 
phenomenon. But yeah, there's there's some guys that we know that the only reason why they get their button is because they understand it's a, it's an opportunity to further their that they they really aren't really caught up too much in the mystique and the and that kind of shit. But for some guys, that's still really important that the you know to to have that kind of affiliation as part of your identity. You know, and as we wrap up here, um, I think that cities like Providence, Boston, and Philadelphia, and maybe Buffalo, we don't know what their, um, the status of their making ceremonies. We just know that there's a lot more guys there than we anticipated. But it, it, at least when it comes to New England and Philadelphia, it seems like those are two families, the Patriarcha and the Bruno Scarfo family, that are, and I'm not counting New York because New York is like a machine. They're never going to stop. But it seems like these two groups in the 2020s are very, uh, are acting in a sense of urgency to be infusing their organizations with new blood on a pretty, because I've heard, and I want to end just, I know that we're, uh, this is a Providence centric episode, but let's just do a quick uh, uh, update on what's going on in Boston with the patriarchas. You know, just like I heard there was a, a new initiate class the last couple of years in Providence, I, I, I've heard that, you know, a, a quite a few younger guys in Boston over the last five years ha, have been made, including relatives of the Denunzio brothers, younger guys, guys in their 30s and 40s. Um, it's, it, it just seems like <laughs> I'm going to bring out a term from college football, like where they say in the SEC, it just means more. Mm -hmm. It's like it seems like in some of these cities, continuing the legacy, continuing the traditions, um, as opposed to like a Detroit and Chicago, who I think, not that their organizations are dead or dying, but they're a lot, um, they're a lot, they're more hesitant to bring guys in. Yeah, and even with some sometimes bringing guys in that are the sort of legacy, you know, people that are relatives, there's a whole spectrum of behavior. There, there's some guys that are, that are made and it, and it really is uh, a lot of it. Almost all of it is symbolic and mm -hmm. hardly any of it's entrepreneurial at all in the sense of your dad, grandfather, your uncle. And so it's like, you're expected to go, your dad owns a grocery store and your, your great granddad started it and your dad yeah. ran it. Now you're, expected that's what to you're, run that's what you're going to. And so, it probably does help in terms of networking and context, even in the legitimate world, right? And so, I mean, I think you see that with, with some of the Detroit guys who, like, um, aren't necessarily what we would think of as gangsters, but they have their button because yeah. of, because of their, the, the legacy and, the, and the, to this idea of, like, keeping this thing, this tradition going. Uh, but they're not necessarily gangsters. So I don't know about what these Boston guys, what they're – Again, there's a whole spectrum of behavior from like pure gangster to guys that are more like sort of a, what was what's George's term like racketeering, right? right. The difference. <laughs> well, the difference. Well, I, I think one of the greatest, you know, kind of anecdotes I heard from from Phil Leonetti when I sat with him, you know, he it's not like he was he was really saying something that his uncle used to say, but I had I hadn't really ever heard it before. Where he was like, you know, Scott, there's a difference between a yeah. gangster and a racketeer. Well, I think there's real criminological yeah, value right. in that kind of analysis. Right. I think that's a good way to put it. And and then even within those spectrum, like you can even cut up more where there's like racketeers and then there's like racketeering light. Right. You know, guys. That's what George and Anastasia are like when you're bringing a case and it's just, you know, basically gambling. Yeah. It's called racketeering light. Yeah. There, yeah. there are no baseball. No, sorry, not baseball. There are no basketball. football or basketball sentences where you're going away for right. 30, 40, 50 years. Right. Um, so in Boston right now, I believe the denunzios are still kind of the, the final say, but I have heard that another one of these OGs, Spucky Spagnolo, could be the street boss right now, could be the kind of the day-to-day -day, um, overseer. Um, but the denunzios are, are they're, they're still, you know, they're still forces to be reckoned with. They're relatively younger guys uh, in their early 60s, and they got a lot of younger guys that look up to them uh, guys in the North end. Um, like I said, guys that are in their thirties and forties, probably early fifties right now. Um, so it doesn't look like uh, they have bench issues. They seem to have a pretty long bench. Uh, and then finally, I will say uh, we'd be remiss not to tie our boys from Philadelphia in here. 
Um, the Philadelphia New England crew, which I'm told is in both Boston and Providence these days, um, is active. And this was a group that the Merlino crew uh, activated in the late 90s. This is an... <laughs> This is another lightning rod on some of these online forums, no, people that don't, that think, but I mean, it that is. think you're making this up. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I don't know how you could say I'm making this up. First of all, Bobby Luigi, we have a first. Wait, wait, first of all, this the fact that or you're saying that I'm making up that it's that it's been rehabilitated. Not that yeah, it happened. Yeah, right, right. I mean, it's right. undisputed that it existed. Right, I mean, right. it, it was in multiple federal yeah, yeah. court filings. And, and we've we had, had Luisi people, on our the, show. The that, capo of that group right, flipped, right. Bobby Luisi. Yeah. Um, right. So there's there's the a uh, there there seems to be a, a contingent online that has a lot of problems with a lot of stuff I report, <laughs> but they they don't believe right that that in the last four or five years or five six seven years that that group has uh, come back. Right. But what I will say to that is, well, then explain why Sean Vettery who was one of Bobby Luisi's guys and was convicted of being a part of that New England crew representing the Philadelphia mob. Why is Sean Vettery coming to Philadelphia so much? Why does the FBI have surveillance photos of Sean Vettery visiting the Philadelphia mob clubhouse? Why do they have uh, videos of him going to the weddings of the daughters and the nieces of these guys? So is he just coming into Philadelphia because he, 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 he wants the, to go? He wants to go see the Liberty Bell. Yeah, he likes the Philly steaks, right? <laughs> the cheese steaks. And, and I know I got some grief from some people with reporting that um, he was at the what was dubbed by government by the government as like as the Capo's table um, at the. Uh, I said it was a wedding. I I misspoke. It was an engagement party. You got to be you know very clear with these guys. An engagement party that he was at. Uh, at the Capo's table. Um, and the only reason I want to bring this up as we close this episode is because allegedly the, the impetus to get this crew back up and moving after it had gone dormant in 2000, it had been gone dormant for about a decade and a half. Maddie Guglielmetti was locked up with Georgie Borghese, who is uh, Joey Merlino's, one of his best friends, alleged to be the acting boss of Philly right now. And I'm told that because of that relationship that was uh, built in prison, that Maddie now in Providence is overseeing that New England crew, as opposed to like Bobby Luisi back in the day, who was overseeing it out of Boston. And that Sean Vettery is the guy that they have in Boston. Maddie oversees the, the, the guys that are loyal to Philly and Providence. And Again, something that you can't dispute. We can talk about what it means, but what is undisputed is that there's a guy from Philadelphia who lives in Westerly, Rhode Island, and owns a pizza shop there. And in that pizza shop, allegedly, there's quite a bit of meetings that go on between Philadelphia guys and New England guys. There's a lot of Philadelphia guys going to get an audience with Maddie. I'm still, this is a whole other issue, but I'm, I'm still surprised that patriarch of family allowed that allows that I, I, maybe because it's lucrative or whatever, but um, it's just unusual for well, I a heard, family to allow another family to set up shop literally in their backyard. Even yeah. if you're getting a piece of it, it's just, it's, well, I heard there, there was an issue or there was some type of sit down in the last couple of years where the Boston guys were going to Maddie being like, you got to give us more money from this. Like if this is going on, like, yeah. we're not seeing enough. Right. I remember that. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, there is precedent. I, I think this was, but this caused a lot of tension was uh, Bruno allowing the Gambinos yeah. to come down. And it, that was literally their bet. That was Philly territory, Atlantic city, Cherry Hill, even Philly. This, the Cherry Hill Gambino guys had action in Philly. I'll tell you one of the things I'm most eager for. If this case ever in snares, Matty Guglia, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, photo uh, images and video of Dino there's quite a bit of Eddie Lato, uh, even more recently of Eddie Lato. But I don't believe there has been any video footage or mug shots that I've seen of Matty Guglielmetti in a good, you know, I, all the photos you can get of him online are from the 80s and early 90s. I'd be really interested in what Matty Guglielmetti looks like right now. 
He's probably good looking. He's good looking guy. He probably kept his head of hair. And uh, so we're going to, that, that's it for this episode. Uh, I enjoyed breaking down what was going on in Providence. We'll probably do another episode when this, if, if this case actually hits this year, do an update. Um, I, I have a, a line out to a, um, another former member of, of law enforcement in Providence, a retired FBI agent. We love Steve O'Donnell. He was great. Um, and hopefully he'll join us uh, in the future. But uh, I got another guy that I want to bring on at some point in the next couple months. So I love New England. I, I, uh, I got family roots there. I've spent a lot of my time, uh, of my, a, lot, a lot of time in my life in Boston, Providence area. I consider it a second home. It's a nice area. I love, um, and I think this, this aspect of it, the underworld, this landscape is really fascinating in that. In that region. I agree. So uh, we'll, uh, we're glad we could give you this episode. We had a lot of people asking for it. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. For Benny Behind the Glass and the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato, I'm Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, out.